morning, church family. It's good to be with you this morning. Hope you enjoyed a great Thanksgiving with your family. And that's a joy to be gathered in here as a church family this morning. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Is where we're going to start as a church this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And if you haven't figured it out already, our order and our flow of service is a little bit different this morning. So let me tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to chase a theme, a topic through Scripture from this passage, really about gospel transformed generosity. What does gospel transformed generosity look like in us? What does it look like in us as a church family? I'm going to follow that up in just a few minutes with an elder conversation. A few of our pastors are going to join me on, on stage. We're going to talk that out. We're going to talk it out around our 2024 budget as a church and I'm going to talk about some family things this morning uh, as a church. Really excited, really practical, really helpful for us this morning. So before we do that, we're going to spend some time right here in this incredible text, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now before we dive in, let me just tell you a story of something that happened to me several years ago and for some reason it made such an impression, I still remember it today. So Jennifer and I were visiting a church, we were in Tampa, Florida uh, we were in a Sunday morning service just like this, and there was a point in the service that the entire congregation just spontaneously erupted in applause and cheers, and it was just a celebration. And you say, well, when was it? Well, and it actually wasn't when they began preaching the word. It, it wasn't when they began singing. It was when the, the pastor stood up near the end of the service, and he said, it's time for the offering. <laughs> it's time to give. And man, that church, not in a, uh, it, it wasn't for show. It really was an overflow of years and years and years of being discipled well, of being taught well what the Bible says about this thing of gospel transformed generosity. See, I really believe that church understood what the scripture says in places like Acts 20 when Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to what? You see, Jesus said that. I think that church knew well the teaching of the Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs that says, in the idea of our possessions and what is entrusted to us, Proverbs 11 says, there is one who scatters, yet increases all the more. There is one who withholds what is justly due, but it results only in want. Proverbs 11.25, the generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. 2 Corinthians, where we're going to look in just a few minutes, chapter 9 says, God loves a cheerful giver. See, the Bible has an immense amount of things to say when it comes to our money and our possessions and things like that. And I want to be really clear here this morning, the whole foundation of everything we're going to say this morning is the reality that the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his life, the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us who believe. Amen? You, you all missed it there. Let me say that again. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms those who believe. All of us. It transforms every aspect of our lives. It transforms your relationship with God. It transforms your relationships with others. It transforms your relationship to money and possessions and our stuff. We see it differently as those who are in Christ because we've been transformed. So practically, we want to talk about that a little bit this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and really into chapter 9. We're going to talk about generosity. We're going to talk about giving. And what you have here is a classic text in Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, I want you to get the context. We're going to read some verses, and I want you to understand what's going on here. Paul, the apostle, 
is writing to a local church just like us, church at Corinth. He's writing to them to spur them on to encourage them in a particular area of growth, in the area of giving and generous living and generosity. Now, to spur them on, he's going to use another church as an example of giving, as a model. He's going to use it, the churches of Macedonia. We're going to read that in just a minute. And churches of Macedonia, those were the churches of Philippi and Thessalonica. So Paul says, look, I want you to grow in giving. I want you to grow in generosity. And I'm going to use some of these other churches that model it so well to spur you on. That's kind of what we're going to do this morning as we walk through these passages. Now, some of you are probably already a little suspicious and a little nervous. Because you say, Pastor Mike, are we, are we talking about giving finances money? 100% unapologetically, that's exactly what we're talking about. As one of your elders, as one of your pastors, I do want to just say, I, I personally, after years of being in the ministry and being... Uh, really the beneficiary of really solid biblical teaching around this area. I just want to say, I, I refuse to apologize for teaching a church about what the Bible says about giving. In fact, I'll just say this. If you have come from a church or your background is you were in a church where the, the staff or the pastors, they were apologetic about teaching on giving, they ought to be the ones to apologize. We teach what the Bible says because there's an area of joy and fullness, and satisfaction, and a life that is honoring to God, and impacting others when it comes around this area of generosity, and giving generously unto the Lord. We're not teaching because we're behind on church budget. We're not teaching because the giving's low. That's not the point. On behalf of your elders, this is not something we want from you. It's something we want for you. Let's grow together in this area of generosity and giving. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read a few verses, we're going to draw out some big ideas this morning, make it real applicable to you, and then I'm going to invite my brothers up on stage, we're going to talk through it as a church this morning. All right, you guys ready? Two of you. Okay, here we go, number one. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He's using the churches of Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica as examples. Verse 2. He says, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy... And their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. You see the topic Paul's dealing with here. Verse 3, he says, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, he says, and they gave beyond their means of their own accord. Verse 4, they were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Paul's going to teach broadly on giving and generosity. He's using a specific example of their giving to help the church in Jerusalem, the struggling church in Jerusalem. But broadly, he's teaching on this idea of giving and generosity. Verse 5. And this, not as we expected, Paul says. He says, these churches, they went way beyond what they thought we thought they would do. How'd they do that? Because they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Incredible verse. Jump down verse 7 for sake of time. But as you excel in everything, Paul's saying to the Corinthians, man, you're a church that's growing. You're like us, you're a church that's healthy in so many ways. He says, I want you to continue to excel in this. He says, you're excelling in faith, and you excel in speech, and you excel in knowledge, and you excel in earnestness, and, and our love for you. See that you excel in this act of grace also. He's wanting them to expand, if you will, in our discipleship language, their understanding of generosity and giving. 
Verse 9, here's the basis and the motivation. Paul read this earlier. Gospel transformed giving is rooted in this. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you by his poverty might become rich. So the big truth we're going to chase this morning is the same big truth. If, if you're a middle schooler, you know this is the same FDP truth you were chasing last week. And parents, if you want more resources to walk your kids through this, that's the FDP lesson last week. Same big truth is this. The church is radically generous. The church, not the institution, but God's people are called, equipped, enabled by the gospel of Jesus to model to the world this lavish, radical generosity that is rooted and points back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This verse 9 indicates that Jesus modeled, he, here's, here's a way to think about it, Jesus disadvantaged himself so that others could be advantaged. That's kind of generosity. Paul calls them here to a a life of generosity. The the word generosity as it's used here, this is a great word picture. Generosity means you live with things on your fingertips. In other words, whatever God has placed in your hand, you realize it's from God. I'm going to hold it loosely. If he wants me to give it back, he certainly can. I'll keep my hands open. He can put as much in my hand as he wants, but I hold everything loosely on my fingertips. It's all his anyway generosity this is beyond cultural philanthropy this is beyond even goodwill this is spirit empowered God honoring joyful self-denying sacrificial gospel advancing life of generosity Paul is calling the Corinthians and calling us to this and let me just say let's just acknowledge something a life of generosity is is crazy countercultural. <laughs> See, I came across a stat this week that I thought was incredible. By the time a person is 20 years old, they will have seen one million television commercials. The vast majority of those commercials are not discipling us toward generosity and giving. I promise you, they're discipling us toward self and toward keeping and getting. The Bible disciples us another way. So I want to give you some big ideas that flow out of this really quick. What does this look like for us? What does this look like for us as a church? Now look back at verse 1, chapter 8. Paul says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Then he's going to describe their context in which they gave. He says, verse 2, for in a severe test of affliction, I want to circle that word if you write in your Bible, He says their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Here's your first big idea practically this morning is this. We give regardless of circumstances. (laughs) There's some words here in this passage that don't seem to go together. He says this model I'm holding out to you. These Philippians... They were experiencing, it was a region that we know had been ravaged by war. It was a province of the Roman Empire. Their resources had been plundered by Rome. They were an extremely poor region. And Paul takes one of the most poor regions in all of the Roman Empire to use as an example of their giving. It's incredible. So for you and I, we learned something this morning that we begin patterns and habits of giving regardless of our circumstances. Let me just make that even more practical for us. Sometimes we think in our area of giving and generosity and being generous to others and giving through our local church, here's the thought we have. We say something like this, well, you know, it's just not a real good season for me to begin to give. (laughs) That's not what the Philippians thought. That's not what the Macedonians thought. In fact, the Bible says from their place of poverty, 
they were overflowing with radical generosity. We tend to think, God, when I get everything in order, when I get all my finances in order, then I'll begin to give. Let me push back biblically from, with you on that. I assure you, someone who's been trying to walk with God for a long, long time, when Jennifer and I were first married 28 years ago, we were poor. We were taught, though, start honoring God first. Let me tell you something. Until you honor God first as a believer in your area of finances, you'll never get your financial house in order. It doesn't work that way. There's a principle throughout Scripture that says we honor God first. So we give regardless of our circumstances. Secondly, look at verse 3. For they gave according to their means. As I testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Here's a second big idea for you. It's this. We give proportionally, we give sacrificially, and we give willingly. You see that all right here in these verses 3 and 4, proportionally. Proportionally means in our giving it works like this. Not everyone was able to give the same, but everyone gave. Everyone gave as was... Allowed by their means. It was this proportional giving. Sometimes our giving is sacrificial. It's always proportional, but it's often sacrificial. It says some gave beyond their means. What that means is their giving meant that they had to do without some things that were maybe less important to honor God first in the area of their giving. I think that's something I want my family to continue to learn to practice. I want my church family to continue to learn to practice, especially at Christmas. We'll talk more about this in just a minute. It's one of those seasons where we can say, hey, maybe we can get that next Christmas gift or that next Christmas gift. Or you know what? Maybe we'll not do that and we'll give generously to benefit others. We'll, we'll do something that's more important. Our giving will be sacrificial. We'll disadvantage ourselves for the advantage of others and then Paul says they gave willingly they, they gave it, it says of their own accord that means not out of pressure not out of guilt but this grace pr produced in light of the gospel in light of who Jesus is this earnestness to be a conduit for God's resources into the lives of other people that was the church here in Philippi I'll give you another one. Look at verse 3 again. He says, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Verse 4, Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Let me give you another reason we give and we learn to give. It's this, is we give missionally. We give missionally. That's true for us as individuals, that's true for us as a church. What does that mean? Well, here for them, this church in Philippi, this model is their sacrificial, faithful, generous giving was given through the church at Corinth to benefit another church all the way in Jerusalem. In other words, they didn't see just giving, and we say this a lot, I don't want you to hear this, it's just a tagline. They, they saw giving not just to their local church, but they really saw it as giving through their local church. They didn't hoard their resources like this. They said, we can give through this local church and it will be a benefit to those throughout the world. That's the way it works here. That's the way it works here for us. We give missionally. We, we also believe there's a model that you see here that Paul was encouraging those disciples and encouraging those young believers. Live generously. Live with everything on your fingertips. But start your giving through your local church seems to be a biblical principle throughout the New Testament. It doesn't mean the only place you give. It's not the only place you live generously. But I just encourage you to begin, as the way the Bible tells us to, begin by giving generously through our local church. Application of this is the biblical model seems to be our first place of giving starts right here with God's people in the local church. One of the most impactful authors in this whole topic for me is a, a guy named Randy Alcorn. His story is incredible. His books are so shaping. Treasure Principle, Eternity Principle, and some great books. He said this. He says, it seems to me that our giving should go first to where the center of God's plan is 
which is the local church. I love that. We just believe there's a thousand different places to give and live generously, but we do believe the biblical model is to begin through our local church. So we give proportionally, we give sacrificially, we give willingly, we give missionally. I'll give you a few more examples really quick. Verse 5. Verse 5. Paul says, and this, this issue of giving and generosity, he says, and this, they gave not as we expected. He said their model exceeded our expectations. What do you mean, Paul? He says, but they, talking about the church at Philippi, this is a great statement here. He says, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. In other words, they, they obey this issue of giving because they had first given all of themselves unto the Lord. Why don't you just think about the impact of that? That leads us to, to the next big idea is this, is we give worshipfully. You say, I'm not sure worshipfully is a word. I'm not sure it is either, but you get the idea. We give worshipfully. In other words, this is one of the reasons I think when we start talking about giving and finances with people, whether it's in a group sitting like this or it's in a disciple-making context or whatever it is, people start to get a little personal and a little almost offended like you're getting into my business. Here's why it's so important, and this is what it reveals about us. To whatever we worship most, we will willingly give most. Now, that's not easy for me to say, and that wasn't easy for me to write this week because that points back at me first. I am created to be a worshiper. So are you. I am worshiping something all the time. And when it comes to our finances and our resources, what happens is to whatever we give with the most energy, to whatever we give with the most zeal, to whatever we give with the most joy, guess what? That might reveal to us what we value most. So Paul says, look, church at Philippi, they had fully given themselves in worship to the Lord, and their, their pocketbooks followed. They joyfully gave, because to them, they had already given themselves fully to the Lord. The great principle here, our finances often reveal the condition of our hearts. That's why it gets personal for us sometimes. Jesus took it a step further, though. He said, not only does our giving reveal our hearts, your giving can also direct your heart. Do you know that? Jesus said it this way in, in Matthew 6, 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, wherever you direct your giving, wherever you steer your resources, wherever you steer your investments, guess what happens? Your heart will follow. Wired that way. So giving ultimately is an expression and an act of worship. Now, let's try to make it really practical here for you. I want you to jump ahead. Let's look on up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul goes from almost a model of giving, and then he gets really practical with some exhortation beginning in verse 6. We'll do these quickly. Verse 6, he says this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly is also going to reap sparingly. It's an agricultural metaphor. You get it. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one, verse 7, here's where it gets very practical. Each one must then give as he has decided in his own heart. Not reluctantly. Not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. By the way, I want you to notice something here. I, I'll, I'll just give you your next big idea. It's this. We give consistently. We give joyfully. The Bible does not say here God loves giving. <laughs> you know what? God's not poor. God doesn't need your money. 
Not called God in heaven, you know, hoping, man, I really hope Tri-Cities comes through. I don't know how I'm going to co- accomplish the great plan of redemption. God does not need our giving. It's about our hearts. It's about our worship. We give consistently and joyfully, consistently here. There was an intentional plan. Each one had decided in his heart. It wasn't just responsive. It wasn't just whatever was left over at the end of the month. There was an intentional plan overflowing from a heart of worship in which they gave. We want to grow in that. I encourage you to grow in that. Joyfully, he says he loves a cheerful giver. Overflow of a heart just captivated by the greatness of Christ. He says not reluctantly. You know what that means? Well, I'm going to give, but I'm not happy about it. (laughs) God doesn't need your money. He says not under compulsion. That means it's not because of external obligation. It's not because you think you ought to. It's not... No, overflowing heart transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just real honesty, people ask, and, I, and we'll talk about this more in the elder conversation in just a second. What, 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 is that, what does all this look like for you and Jennifer, Pastor Mike, and you, in your family? And in a moment of honesty, I mean, we, 28 years ago when we were first married, this church was our home. And I am deeply grateful for men like Jim Fuller, who's sitting right back here, and Gene Ramilliot, who I'm not sure where he is this morning, invested in us. They discipled us. They poured into us this area of giving. I learned that here at this church many years ago. So for the last 28 years, we have tried to honor God first, the first of whatever comes in through the local church, regular tithes and offerings. And we as, a, we as a family, we've given through give to go We'll talk more about that in just a minute. We have that privilege here as a church to our missional offering that really touches the world. We give to other places. We give to other ministries. But we start here. And we've tried to model that for the last 28 years. And I want to wrap this up. And I want to wrap it up with, with a promise that you see here in this text. And I, in fact, I'll invite the team just to come on up and into play, then Paul's going to walk us through a response, and we're going to have an elder conversation. But, but I, want, I want you to hang with me. I want, you to, I want you to be real honest, because here's where some of you are, even as we talk about this area of giving, it makes you nervous. And, and the idea of giving financially, there, there's a fear involved with that. I want you to look at verse 8 again of chapter 9, and I want you to realize the promises of God that undergird all of our giving and our generosity. Chapter 9, verse 8, just read this and we'll wrap it up. Verse 8 says, and God is able. See, if fear is hindering your generosity, I, I want you to go to verses like this and just begin to pray these verses. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency... In all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. The most important phrase in that verse is how that verse begins. God is what? Able. Able. Yeah. God's not poor. God's not limited. God does not dole out to us in small portions. He lavishes on us his grace. God is able. Verse 10, and he who supplies everything you have is ultimately from the hand of your loving, generous father. All of it. He who supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Last big idea is this. We give trusting God as our faithful provider. God's able. Claiming the promises of God as your provider and his infinite wealth allow us to give without fear and give as an act of worship and give as an overflow of the gospel transformed lives of who we are in Christ. We give trusting God as our faithful provider.
Father, thank you for this challenge. Thank you for this truth. Lord, I pray that you now, by your Spirit, will enable us to be not merely hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word for your glory in Jesus' name.